chapter one notes, Spencer coined the phrase survival of the fittest. A lot of people think that is actually Darwin, but it's actually Spencer, a sociologist who was talking about societies and society's ability to survive by changing over time. And so he talked about it from the standpoint of survival of the fittest. Um, under Durkheim, found people with weaker social ties were more likely to commit suicide. Up to that point, the idea always was is that people that committed suicide, probably there was a religious uh, reason for that. Uh, a lot of times it was women, women living by themselves, uh, mainly because their husbands had passed away, their children had moved on to other families, and so they would end up by themselves and people would go, okay, women, they have trouble resisting the devil, and so the devil would get them to commit suicide. Um, Durkheim came along and said, you know, maybe it's that they're just really depressed, really sad, uh, they're all alone, and so they commit suicide because they just don't want to continue living. Protestant ethic is a self-denying approach to gaining wealth. We really don't have that so much anymore. The reason being, early Protestantism, for the most part, they believed that you couldn't really know if you were going to heaven. Uh, you were either part of the chosen or you were not part of the chosen. And so they finally decided maybe the way you could know is if you were doing well financially. And so the Protestant uh, ethic that way became something where you would work harder than your neighbor to make more money so you felt better about your chances of going to heaven. Uh, Protestantism changed a little bit to where a lot of Protestant churches now believe that you, know, you bow your head and you ask Christ into your heart. But early on, they didn't really think that so much. They felt like they were either chosen or not and the only thing they knew was God blesses those that he loves, and so they said, okay, if you're rich, you're probably going to heaven. If you're not rich, you may not be going to heaven. So they worked their butts off to kind of make sure and feel better about their chances of going to heaven. Um, under symbolic interactionism, example there is why are divorces increasing? Well, the reason that a symbolic interactionist would say they're uh, uh, increasing is because the definition of marriage and divorce have changed. Uh, divorce at one time was seen as a very negative type of thing. You know, it was shunned. Nobody wanted to talk about divorce. Nobody definitely wanted to be divorced. Now, in our society, it's more accepted. And as the definition of divorce especially has changed to a more acceptable uh, type of definition, uh, the symbol of divorce is not as negative as it used to be. Symbolic interactions say because of that, people are more likely to choose divorce. Uh, down at manifest and latent functions. Example, government wants a higher population growth rate. So here's what they do. They want more, they want a higher population. So they say, we're going to give for the next five years $100,000 to every woman that gives birth to a child. On the day that the child is born, you get a check from the government for $100,000. Now, manifest function is intended. You know these are coming. The manifest function of this is more children. More babies being born. You know that's going to happen. People are going to want that $100,000 check. They're going to have a lot of babies. Late function are those things that you're not sure what might happen. So one example could be maybe um, more uh, child neglect. You know, maybe people start having children not because they want children, but instead because they want the money. And then all of a sudden the money dries up after a couple of years. They've spent it all on things and they have a child that they never really wanted. And so maybe a latent function might be child neglect increases. Okay, then under conflict theory, why is the divorce rate increasing? Well, they're looking at power structures. And for them, the reason they would say is that women have more power today. Uh, if you look back in the 1950s, you know, if a woman wanted to divorce, she had to convince her dad that she needed to divorce her husband because normally she moved back in with her dad and her mom. Uh, nowadays, a woman can get a divorce. She, can, she has a job, you know. Back a long time ago, women usually didn't have jobs and make money. Uh, so, you know, now that they have jobs, they can make money, they're getting educations, they have more power in that structure, and so they're more, they have a greater ability to say, I don't want to take this, I'm out. And so because of that greater power, a conflict theorist would say it has increased uh, divorces because of that. Macro-level and micro-level theorists. The example there is homeless. A macro-level study on homeless is what is the percentage of homeless people uh, in Roanoke City? Uh, what is the percentage of men to women in Roanoke City homeless? It's, it's that type of study. It's numbers for the most part. 
Um, as far as the micro level theorists, the symbolic interactionists, they would actually go into uh, the facility and try to figure out why they're homeless. So they would ask them questions. What were you doing before you became homeless? Where were you? And so they would then come up with their study based on their interactions with the people that are homeless. Whereas macro, just count them up. How many males, how many females, how many adults, how many children, whatever. Whatever your study might be, you just count them up and you come with these numbers that way. And then close-ended and open-ended questions. Uh, which one is better? It sounds like an open-ended question would be better. But the problem with an open-ended question is this. Let's say you're trying to find out who was the better if uh, Bill Clinton did a good job as president. And so you um, open in a question, you would say, do you think Bill Clinton did a good job as president? And you would just leave this blank space. And somebody writes in, I think he did a pretty good job on the economy because uh, the, um, the jobs were there, people were getting good pay increases during his eight years as president, so I think he did a good job there. But I think he kind of you know, didn't do enough with possible terrorists and Al-Qaeda that was getting stronger, and I wish he'd have focused more on that. Well, then you, as the person reading it, have to decide. Did they actually think he did a good job or a bad job? They seem to answer both. So a lot of time a close-ended question is better just because you can say, did Bill Clinton do a good job as president? Yes, no, don't know. And if they put yes, they mean yes. If they put no, they mean no. So open-ended can be good in some cases. Uh, but you have to be careful with an open-ended questionnaire because you might get answers that you're not real sure what the people mean by what they wrote in. And then the last thing, uh, memorization experiment, ex ethics and research. The memorization, um, what they did was is they were going to try to find out if the fear of pain would cause somebody uh, to memorize better. Or at least that's what they told, let's say I was in the study. They gave me uh, $5 to be a part of the study. They told me, we're going to try to see if the fear of pain will make somebody study better. Kind of like in sports, you know, if you miss so many free throws or if you don't do something right, you know, the coach might have you run 50 wind sprints or something. So it's that fear of a negative. Will it make you uh, do better, concentrate better? Um, but really, it was a test to see whether or not me, uh, being the person they were testing, uh, was willing to kill somebody for $5. And so they would bring somebody else in and go, okay, we're going to put them in the hallway. We're going to hook them up to these little diodes and everything and shoot electric shock into them if they miss uh, the question. And um, you're going to come in here, and all we're going to do is you're going to have a microphone, they're going to have a microphone, and you're going to be able to you know, talk to each other. So we'd go through blue water, red meat, green grass, and go through like 10 of those. Then I would go back through and say blue. And the person from the hallway that I think is hooked up to diodes, but they're really not because I'm being tricked, would say water. I'd say red. And they, instead of saying meat, they would intentionally say dog. And I'd go, oh, wrong, and I'd push a button. Well, the, the question was, would I keep pushing buttons? Because each time they missed, I'm supposed to shock them with a higher degree of electri electricity. The question really was, would I keep pushing that button all the way up until I thought they were dead? Um, what we found is about... 30 to 40 percent of people, as long as there was somebody in their ear saying, this is not your responsibility, this is part of a study, shock them even if it kills them, would go ahead and push the button, which sort of shocked the people that were doing the study. Uh, but you can't do that. The reason you can't do that is because I would end up in counseling, because at the end of it they would say, we really wanted to see if you were willing to kill somebody for five dollars, and you were. And then that would screw me up, and I would end up going into counseling to try to figure out why I was willing to kill somebody for $5. That type of experiment is no longer allowed.